Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of If This Car Could Talk. Today we're bringing you a car that few have seen since their duty on the nation's drag strips has long since passed. Only 52 of these badass special purpose AMX drag cars ever rolled out of the shop at Hearst Performance and more than 50 years have passed since. Today they're only seen at events like McCacken in Chicago each November or maybe an AMC national meet. But considering the hard life of a drag car plus natural attrition, and you'll understand why only a handful of these significant cars still exist today to tell the tale of the legendary muscle car wars of the 1960s and early 70s. The battles that were waged between manufacturers meant sales, which translated to profits and even more sales. Yes, even the small independents of that time like Studebaker and American Motors knew how important it was to win races in all forms of motorsports. The AMX Superstocker we're bringing you today is part of a one-of-a-kind red, white, and blue AMC collection of collector and restorer Dan Curtis. We got an exclusive on shooting this car since it was recently completed. When we brought you Dan's four other red, white, and blue muscle cars, this one was still undergoing its complete and authentic restoration. Well, now that it's done, here she is. Now, what do you guys think? It's an impressive collection, and we've linked the previous videos below. So check them out or see them again. Now, let's go for a ride. The car we're looking at today is Superstock AMX number 52, the last of the Superstock AMXs made. The interesting story about this car is that the dealer up in Alaska, Sunset Motors, had ordered this when the AMC company made it known to the dealers that they could get these cars, and there's, they were told that their car would not be coming at all because 50 orders had already been placed. So lo and behold, at the end of June in 1969, a car transport carrier shows up with a Superstock AMX on it, and the dealer had no idea that the car was even going to be uh, arriving, let alone that they were going to get one. So the car proceeded to be uh, raced by the dealership in its first year in 1969, and then uh, a fellow by the name of Gary Clark uh, had seen the car at the dragways because he was a racer as well. And he fell in love with it, and he kept on hounding the dealership after the race season to sell it to him. And so eventually, uh, the, the fellow that he was talking to continued to keep it away from his father, and eventually then uh, Gary happened to talk to the owner of the dealership, the father, and the guy said, well, I want it less price for it, and Gary said sold, and the son was really ticked off because he lost his race car. So fast forward, uh, the car started being raced uh, with 1970 fascia and taillight and dash because AMC had offered to update those cars uh, to a 1970 looking model. But coincidentally, the uh, NHRA uh, banned all of these cars because they were 1969 chassis and not 1970, so they were disqualified for putting, if you will, lipstick on a pig except this car. In the Pacific Northwest where this car raced, there were not enough cars in the classes that it was racing, which was super stock. I think at the time it started out in D and it went all the way up to A. There were, enough there were not enough cars in the class, so they allowed this specific super stock AMX, number 52, American Dream, to be run with the 70 fascia. And it was the only one that was allowed to do that, only because there weren't enough cars to race up there. So the car became very successful. It ended up being a three-time NHRA regional champion, and it was pretty fast, and I'm sure it annoyed a whole bunch of Ford and GM and Mopar owners because in the quarter mile with the stuff it basically came from American Motors with, the exception of a camshaft upgrade, the car was turning uh, below 10 and a half seconds and over 130 miles an hour. For a car that came out of the factory, uh, to be able to get into the uh, lower half of the 10 second bracket and over 130 miles an hour, that was quite an accomplishment. So over the years, it, uh, it morphed a couple of times with different paint schemes, and I chose to return it back to its original paint scheme, the way it came from AMC. However, I did choose also to retain the graphics that it was raced with, which is American Dream. You'll notice on the front of the car uh, a set of tires, on uh, very skinny tires on racing wheels, and those are the actual wheels that that car was raced with, and those are called Krager Super Tricks. 
In fact, this car was the test mule for the Krager Super Tricks back in that time frame. And those were offered um, by Krager as an aluminum race wheel, coincidentally with aluminum lug nuts as well, which we have replaced with steel ones. <laughs> and um, so that car uh, has a lot of rich history. As you'll notice in some of the, uh, in the slideshow, it has its original window sticker which it sold for, uh, de de delivered to the dealer up in Alaska for $6,300 and some change. A normal AMX would have been in the mid to high threes, so it basically added $3,000 to the cost of these cars, uh, $2,500 to $3,000. And um, you'll notice in one of the slides as well that the speedometer has two miles on it. And that's because when these cars were shipped off to Hearst from American Motors to be modified to become super stock race cars, they, um, the speedometer cable was in the way for what they wanted to do, so they snipped it. So you can tell an original super stock AMX, one of the telltale signs is that the speedometer has you know, two miles or less on it. Another interesting thing that Hearst did, there's no wiper motor. There's no heater motor. There's no heater box. Uh, if you look at some of the uh, pictures in the trunk, you'll notice there's no seam sealer in there. And so when the car was made, it was pulled off the line before all that stuff was added. So no sound deadener, no seam sealer, no wipers, no, no um, heater, and it's a race car. And so rather than weigh over 3,300 pounds, like a standard AMX, it weighed 2,900. And so that's a big difference. Um, the, the conventional wisdom is that every 100 pounds is about a tenth of a second on the quarter mile. So this car, when I got it, um, was a disaster. It had been taken apart to be tube framed and tubbed, and those parts were long gone. So we had to recreate all of the parts that were missing. And in doing so, we found another 69 AMX, and any uh, metal parts that we needed, we just harvested from that roller, which had already been stripped. And so uh, this is a, an original metal, AMC metal race car with the exact same metal in it as when it was raced. The one thing that we had to uh, reproduce was the suspension changes that were created by a gentleman that was moonlighting from Chrysler that came over to the Hearst facility and he helped design the suspension changes on these race car AMXs. And as a result of some of the metal missing, we had to recreate that, which we did. We did have the original rear springs and those um, springs are different heights because of the race car, there's more pressure on the lower right-hand side than on the left-hand side due to the torque of the engine. So AMC and this gentleman who was moonlighting from Chrysler uh, designed a different mounting system for the passenger side rear spring so that even though the car has heavier springs on the right, it will still take off from the, the line uh, straight. And you'll also notice in one of the slides, the battery is in the back in the rear, and that's to shift the weight of the battery uh, away from the front of the car to give more traction at the back end of the car as well as to offset the driver's weight by having it be on the passenger side. Typically that would be located in the front and so when we reconstructed that aspect of the car as well we had to uh, reproduce what had been done by Hearst there. All in all it was a uh, over a three-year project with thousands of hours of body and paint work we built the engine for it in my shop, and as you can tell from the video sound, it's pretty ferocious. And we expect that that engine, although we haven't dynoed it yet, we expect that that engine would run about 625 to 650 horsepower. It's been a heck of a project, and it debuted uh, at a car show earlier in the month uh, for the first time. And uh, as uh, was expected, it took uh, first place in its class, and I'm sure it'll uh, be rewarded for all that work many times over in the in the months and years ahead. Uh, the way I found that car was I created uh, what was called a Breedlove Tribute, which was a 1968 AMX raced by the uh, Craig Breedlove and his wife, which broke uh, 106 24-hour speed records. So I, I did that car back in 2008, and the gentleman that bought it had a local guy do some work on it, and the guy called me up and asked me about uh, what we had done to the car so he could help the new owner. And throughout the conversation, we were talking about various AMCs that we had owned, and he disclosed that he had a super stock AMX that was torn down and that he was going to restore it one day. 
well, fast forward 10 years, and I get a call from him in 2018, and he, out of the blue, and he asked me if I was still interested. You know, I had told him if he ever wanted to sell it to give me a call, and he asked me if I was still interested. And he um, said to me, I'm uh, too old and I'm too fat. I can get down, but I can't get up. And he said, so I'm never going to restore it, and I know the work you do, and uh, would you like to be the person to restore it and to own it? And I jumped at the chance, and lo and behold, um, it actually was the car that completed my red, white, and blue AMC collection of all five factory red, white, and blues. This car was in upstate uh, California. However, it had languished for three decades inside a containerized cargo container up in Alaska after the gentleman that was going to tube frame and tub it had torn it apart. The gentleman that I bought it from was the original owner. He had sold it to a friend, and then he bought it back from the friend, and it had been in Alaska in a cargo container for three decades. I picked it up um, in Northern California, which it had been rescued from Alaska just a year or two before. Yeah, the original owner just uh, contacted me about a month ago, said he found some more stuff for the car and that he was going to send it down, and he had seen the pictures of it, and he was thrilled. He had actually told me when he was inquiring if I wanted to buy it that he wouldn't sell it to anybody that he thought would just turn around and flip it, and he was thrilled that I was a man of my word and restored the car and is now being shown, and he's uh, very... Uh, openly acknowledged in the discussions and the documentation on the car. So you'll notice in some of the slide pictures, it looks like it's got kind of a crummy paint job uh, with spray on the white. And we actually took a lot of, put in a lot of effort to maintain the, the literal poor quality of the red, white, and blue paint job that was applied by Hearst. They basically just taped the car off and sprayed it. So normally when we would paint a car at my AZ AMC restoration shop, we would put rubber tubing in between the gaps so that no paint gets sprayed onto the, the door jams and all that. And in particular, you'll notice the pictures of the trunk where there's, um, there's a paint overspray all over the place, and that's because we, we did not do our normal protect the already painted areas like we normally would do so that it would be as bad a paint job as they did in 1969 when the car was converted. And that paint job on the invoice was um, $78. <laughs> so they got what they paid for. So the engine on this one is a 1969 AMC 390, which we uh, put a 401 crank in. And it has custom gas-ported Weissco pistons. It has a set of forged connecting rods. The inside of the engine is, uh, the rotating assembly is balanced and blueprinted. We have uh, a modifications to the oiling system with an eight-quart pan and a swivel pickup so that when you're drag racing it, when you're hitting the throttle really hard and the oil sloshes to the back of the oil pan, so does the pickup. And when you slam on the brakes before you smack into the wall at the end of the drag strip, the oil flows to the front of the pan and that so does the pickup. Uh, the cylinder heads are actually cylinder heads uh, modified by Crane, which is who Hearst used in 1969 to modify the cylinder heads. And so they have much bigger uh, intake and exhaust valves than they would have from the factory. And then on top of the, uh, and I also have, let me back up, uh, the, I also have a um, custom ground uh, Crower solid lifter uh, flat tappet cam. And that uh, camshaft is almost 700 lift. And the duration, as you can hear in the idle, is quite substantial, so it's a very lumpy idle. And then on the cylinder heads, uh, rocker assemblies, we have uh, Scorpion roller rockers, which um, were not available in 1969, but um, it really enhances the performance of the engine. Yeah, so the valve covers on the car are actually the valve covers that the car was raced with, with the Mickey Thompson breathers on it. And the reason for that, the breathers, is that the... Uh, the intake manifold, which is an Edelbrock cross ram that was specifically made for these race cars, uh, has no PCV valve in it. So when you have an engine without a PCV, which stands for positive crankcase ventilation, and that uh, PCV valve sucks the moisture out of the engine and pushes it down through the carburetor uh, via a vacuum hose, when you lack that, you have to have some place for the extra gas and the moisture to go, and so those breathers um, enable that to occur as the air is rushing by it. It's, pull, it's drafting and pulling the moisture out of the engine. 
And it also is a, a, a manual drum brake car, which is horrifying to think of uh, at trying to stop the thing when you're going 130 plus miles an hour. But uh, hopefully you only had to stop once. So where drum brakes are bad is when you have to repeatedly hit them hard. And the only purpose of these brakes were to stop it by the end of the drag track. Uh, the car was never wrecked. Um, and the, these cars came from the factory with adjustable torsion links from the top of the axles to the frame on the body. And so you could uh, adjust those in and out to make sure that the car took off straight. So one of the pictures that's on the show board that you um, took a picture of is the car with it, both front wheels off the ground and uh, not going sideways. So no, it was never wrecked, um, which is quite an accomplishment for a, a three season racing champion at any dragway. Yeah, thank you for uh, coming to photograph uh, the Superstock AMX number 52. And I own a company called AZ AMC Restorations, which is where the car was actually restored. If you look back to other episodes on the YouTube channel of If This Car Could Talk, you'll also see my other four red, white, and blue factory AMC cars. And the acquisition of this Superstock AMX rounded out the collection to have all five American Motors performance or muscle cars that are done in factory red, white, and blue. And I believe that's the only collection in existence of all five of those. Yeah, my philosophy on cars like this is that they are things that should be used and utilized. Some folks create trailer queens, but I'm not into trailer queens. And this car is by far the more valuable car, but I will take it and drive it because that's what it was made for. And I don't believe having a car is a piece of art. So all my cars get driven, and they get driven hard when the, the opportunity presents itself.